I am so grateful to be here tonight. I'm so, it's such an honor to see faces that I haven't seen in many, many years. So grateful for the presence of each and every one of you uh, here uh, this weekend. Um, my, my main uh, job at, with Latin American Missions is to coordinate medical campaigns. Um, and for those of you uh, who have been involved with Latin American Missions, many of you were introduced into the mission field through medical campaigns. And so uh, you have a really good idea of that. But if you haven't, uh, what I want to talk about tonight is kind of the formula for anybody getting involved in missions. And we find formula in Titus chapter 3. And it's on the, the screens and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help in cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. And so this is kind of the formula that we're going to follow for the next few minutes to talk about how any of us can get involved in mission work. Uh, first of all, it's, it's really interesting to me to see that he starts off by saying, our people. Now, for those of you that have been on any Latin American missions campaign, that idea of our people ought to resonate really deeply in your heart. Their lamb folks are just differently built. And the lamb family is such a, a unique cross-section of the Lord's church. And it is, it's such a blessing because, you know, you talk about, um, you know, the Wednesday night crowd. Those are the, you know, we've talked about, and several people have talked about the commitment and uh, Brother, um, Brother Bob talked about the, you know, need for more commitment and that sort of thing. Um, those that go on mission trips that, are, that I get to work with are some of the most committed people that I've ever met in my life. And I love that about the idea of our people. Um, now, theologically speaking, what Titus here is saying is there is a difference between us and them. That's something that we need to recognize. That's something that all of us have to understand. In fact, why would you even do missions if you didn't recognize that there is an us and a them. Does God make that distinction? Absolutely he does. Uh, in Ephesians chapter um, 1 verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, us, in Christ. That's the difference. That's the one, that, the thing that makes us different. Those of us that are in Christ. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And you know 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, all of these are differentiators of, of a, a line drawn in the sand where there are those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. What does the Bible say about those that are outside of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 13, I wrote you in my letter to not associate with the sexually immoral. And he goes through and talks about sexually immoral, this word, greedy, swindlers, idolaters. But now I'm writing to you not to associate anyone who bears the name of brother who is guilty of these things for not to even eat with such a one. And he says there in verse 12, for what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Again, there's that idea of us and them. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Those who aren't in Christ are outside outsiders. 1 Thessalonians chapter five, 4, verses 9 through 12 says, now, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for me to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by Christ to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing, all the brothers throughout Macedonia. 
But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 gives us a bleak look into what an outsider is. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. And if you're separated in Christ, what does that look like? Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. In fact, if you don't have a very clear understanding between the fact that there is an us and there is a them, why would you even bother going on a mission trip? Why bother talking to your, your neighbor? Why to bother you know, sharing the gospel with somebody that you've just met? Why would you ever bother sharing God's word with anyone if you don't have a clear understanding that there is an us and a them? Because our goal is to make more of them part of us. And I think that's what our world is really missing is in all of the groups that we have divided ourselves into and all of the, the labels that we have attached to ourselves or to others, there's a, a, a level of exclusivity to all of those subgroupings. We're part of this little group, and we don't necessarily want you a part of that group. But in the church, in the Lord's body, that's not how it works. Our goal is to make more of them part of us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, and this is such a powerful verse if you think about it, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. That means we go out representing Christ our Lord every day. That means his message is being sent through us to others. In fact, he goes on to say, uh, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. What is that appeal? We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Imagine God choosing you out of all the people of the world to share his word, his message, his ideas, his goals, his plans. And you're the messenger. That message relies on you to get to, from one person to the next. That's what it means to be an ambassador for Christ Making more of them part of us is exactly what Jesus' goal was. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, he says, Jesus passed from there. He saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose, rose and followed him. And that's our appeal. That's our appeal to everyone that we come into contact with. Just as Paul said, so we also can say, follow me as I follow Christ. So we need to understand very clearly that when Titus here is talking about our people, that that is a very significant, powerful group of people that he's calling out. But next he goes on to say, and let our people learn. I've, I mean, I don't think that this is a surprise, but I do want to bring to your attention that I was not born a missionary. Carrie wasn't born a missionary. Frank wasn't born a director of whatever he directs. (laughs) 
Kirk wasn't born a gospel preacher or an educator. All of these things are learned skills. Learn. That means there's knowledge out there that you could gain that would give you the same skills that we have. We oftentimes look and read through the Bible and we read and talk and think about these skills the list of, of great men and women and characters throughout the Bible. And we revere them. And so we should. We look through that list in Hebrews chapter 11. And we think, wow. What great works of faith those people were able to do. But sometimes we have to stop and remind ourselves that the same blood that runs through their veins runs through our veins. There was nothing significantly different about them that allowed them to do the great works of faith that they were able to do that would disqualify us from doing the same thing. And you know how I know that? I grew up in a house with one of those men. A giant in the faith. I got to sit at the feet every Sunday of one of the elders at Forest Park, mentioned earlier by Brother Bob, Brother Ray, Ray Joyner. A giant. Glenn Cochran, Terry Broom. People that I have so much respect for, but they are, they are to me living embodiments of the faithful men and women that we read about from 2,000 years ago. But neither my dad, nor Ray Joyner, nor Glenn Cochran, nor Terry Broom, or whoever it is in your life that has been a hero of faith to you None of them have any superpowers. None of them are any different. There's no different chemical makeup. There's no special pill that they take. There's no special skill that they have that is any different than what you could have. Because it's all learned. And this is the plea that Titus is making. And let our people learn. I'm, I'm reminded of, of, of and it's, it's simple stuff. I'm reminded of, of, of a guy at church back well before the pandemic uh, saw the need. He saw in the future and saw that, that live streaming was something that we needed to do with our home congregation. Now, this gentleman is not necessarily particularly talented uh, with technology or videography or recording or editing or anything like that didn't have any particular skill or or talent in any of those realms what he did have was a determination he said i'm going to figure it out and the thing that struck me and the thing that i had to ask myself was when's the last time I just learned a skill with, for no other reason than to be a blessing to the church. When's the last time I decided to, to go out and stretch myself so that the church could be blessed by that effort? Not for my glory, but for the advancement of the church. Not for somebody to pat me on the back, not for somebody to give me a paycheck, but so that the church would be better. He learned. And it's such a great example to me to remind myself that I can never stop learning to do. I can never stop learning to try to stretch myself to be better. And, and so we are left then to ask ourselves this. What have I learned lately? 
What have I learned that I can use to be a blessing to the Lord's church? Learning has always been part of God's plan. The first step in the path to salvation is to hear. Which begins the process of learning. When we think about our opportunities to learn and the things that we've seen throughout the Bible, one of the saddest verses that you can even imagine is found in Hosea. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I have rejected you from being a priest for me. And since you have forgotten the law of, the, of your God, I will also forget your children. You might think to yourself, if you haven't been, I know so many of us have been, you've gone and you've participated, but there is a, a certain amount of intimidation about going and doing something you've never done before. Well, one of the great things about mission trips in general, and I, I'm, I'm going to apologize to Kerry because I'm going to steal this. I'll steal it from him for his, le his lesson later. You have an opportunity to see the church working at 100%. Now, all those people that we think about as giants of faith, people like my father, people like Ray Joyner and Charles Cochran and Terry Broom and people that have been effective in my life, you may not even know some of those names, but they're amazing people to me. Those were people that I imagined that were running at 100%. But even me, I saw in my house, in my dad's life, he didn't always work at 100%. But you know people who you feel like, man, that, that, that guy's always working at 100%. You know those people. What if everybody that walked through that door was doing that? Well, how would that change this congregation? How would that change this city? How would that change our world? And what we have as an opportunity to see on, on campaigns like what we lead is we see the church, everybody pulling at 100%. That's what keeps people coming back because that's an addictive feeling. That's something that you can't get enough of because when you see that, you see the hand of God at work. I say all the time, when God's people choose to do God's things, God's way, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Most people that come on campaigns for the very first time, that first 12, 24 hours, it's like they're deer in a headlight. They're kind of a little lost. They're a little intimidated. They, they feel like they've been dropped into this, like, special society of, of superheroes. But by the end of the week, they're one of the superheroes because they learn. They were willing to be a part of it, to immerse themselves in it. And it doesn't matter if they're a maintenance man, if they're a Bible class teacher, if they're a doctor or a dentist or a cook. They've been a part of something special because they've witnessed the church working at maximum capacity. And that's special. He goes on to say, and let our people learn to devote. What are you devoted to? What is that thing that is just in your blood that you just love? Um, I'm teaching on Wednesday nights right now. I'm teaching... Uh, a month-long class to our junior high age back in my home congregation uh, about social media. 
And I told him, I said, if you want to know something about somebody's life, you check two places. Check their social media first. Because that's where you're going to get the highlights. That's where you're going to, you know, if, if, if they've got a sports team that they like, you're going to find it there. If they, if they are uh, really devoted to their family, you're going to find it there. If they're really devoted to the church, you're going to find it there. But what you see on social media is the highlights. It's the it's what people want you to see. I said, the other place you would look is their bank account. You go through the list of purchases on someone's bank account. How do they spend, how, how's, how's the money coming out of that bank account on that debit card or the checks that they write? You find real quick what people are devoted to. When we think about devotion, we're devoted to all sorts of things, a sports team, a family, a job, the pursuit of knowledge. I know people who, are, who have more degrees than I have fingers on my hands. People are devoted to all sorts of things. The Greek word used to describe men leading in their own homes and elders leading in the church is the idea of devotion. That idea that they are out front doing and leading. And so what is out front and leading in your, house, in your life and in your house? Earlier in Titus chapter 3, uh, he says, the saying is trustworthy and I want you, I want you to insist on these things that those who believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Our brother Orlando uh, mentioned in, when he was talking about the need, to, the need to, to look out and search for the need in other people's lives and to meet those needs. The Bible calls that doing good works. And I, I, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But then in Titus chapter 3, verse 9, that very next verse, he says, but avoid these things. He said, devote yourselves to the good works, but avoid these things. Foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. You know anybody that quarrels about insignificant things? <laughs> I mean, open up a, a Facebook feed on anybody and you, you can find just about as much quarreling about insignificant things as you can want to ever read. And I think it's really, it's fascinating how he puts those at odds to each other. One is you've got this profitable thing that is going out and looking at the need in the person that you're, that you're next to. Meet that need. That is profitable. But don't look at that person and think, what do I have that differentiates us? What is it that separates us? What is it that makes them different? What is it that I can use as an excuse not to do the profitable thing? We see how the church took this and, and it blossomed in the early church just right at the beginning. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that, that the church continued and devoted themselves to the teaching and the doctrine of the apostles. Devotion, what we devote ourselves to is how we spend our mental faculties, it's how we spend our money, it's how we spend our time, it's how we spend our effort in all that we do. What are you devoted to? It is an honor to be amongst people who clearly are devoted to mission work. And I thank you for that. He says, 
and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Religiously, theologically, the debate over good works has been going on as long as there have been debates. But it's quite easy to see what at least Jesus saw was good works. We see the apostles following in his footsteps. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brother? You know this verse. What good is it, my brother, if, you, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And listen how he illustrates that point. Okay? Listen how he illustrates the point. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking food, that's that person next to you that we just talked about. Poorly dressed, lacking food. The poorly dressed part you can probably see from the outside. The lacking food you might not be able to see. You might have to be actually involved in to know if they're struggling. My wife's a principal at a, a school that's what they call Title I, which means they receive extra funding because they're, they live in, that school is situated in such a poor area, and the number of kids that come there don't have their basic needs met every single day. But a lot of these kids, you wouldn't be able to look at them and tell, oh, that kid gets three meals a day, but that one doesn't. You'd never be able to tell. But if you pay close attention, you'll notice that there's a kid that eats only half of his lunch. And he tries to very discreetly pack up the rest for later so that he won't go to bed hungry. Unless you're paying attention, unless we're looking for it, you may never know. The gospel has always required us to be involved in other people's lives in so much that we could recognize a need so that we can fill it. And so when we see here in James where he talks about our faith and how that is demonstrated through our works, it's by fulfilling needs. When we think about all the way back, that, that's James, which is kind of later in the New Testament, but going all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, that's what he started off teaching. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, there in verse 16 he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others. We're supposed to be seen and visible and out in front and, and being that reflection of God's glory. Well, how do we do that? What is it, what is it that we can do to bring more glory to God? You shine your light by doing good works so that others can glorify God. Those good things that we do for other people and meeting their needs is how we glorify God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18 says, they are to do good. He's talking specifically about rich people, people who have money and pretty much every single one of us in this room qualifies as a rich person just based on the fact that we live in this country. They are to do good, to be generous and rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You want to talk about living a, a life that is a shining light to the world. 
Get involved in doing good for others on a daily basis. Titus chapter 2, verse 7 says this. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says this. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Think about this for a second. Think about that idea of stir. That, that word pops out to me when I read this verse. Uh, I particularly love making chocolate chip cookies, as you might can tell. Um, so I, I can pretty much quote to you. I can't actually. I probably could if I really thought about it. The recipe on the back of the Nestle Toll House chocolate chips. Uh, I mean, it's two and one quarter cup of flour, three quarter cup of brown sugar, three quarter cup of, of regular sugar, a stick and a half of butter, and then there's some other things. Eggs, two eggs, baking soda, and then love. <laughs> um, but an interesting thing happens when you make any recipe. Um, I, when we were going through the line, we were asking, you know, what the second dish was that was there. It was cheesy potatoes. Emphasis on the cheesy. Um, but when you, when you make a recipe like those chocolate chip cookies, and you take that flour, you take the brown sugar, you take the, the, the white sugar, you, you put in uh, some eggs and some butter, and you stir. What happens when you stir? There's a change. That flour is no longer flour. If you paid me all the money in the world, I wouldn't know what to do to take back out that flour once it's stirred. I'm sure that there is chemically some process that I could do, but I don't have that knowledge. It would be far too expensive to even try it. You can pay me everything that you can pay me to separate the flour and the eggs. And, and But once it's stirred, I think it's such an interesting word that he uses there. Let us stir one another. You see, when Bob stirs me and I stir Carrie, Carrie stirs Rosie, Rosie stirs Frank, sorry. We all become something that we weren't before, something better. And in that stirring, we lose our capacity for any of us to fall away because I could no more separate myself after being stirred than I could separate out an egg after it's been in, added to a recipe. We do that with love and good works. That's how we do it. As we think about all of this, in the context of missions. This is why people have gone for years and decades of their life, spent countless thousands of dollars, dragged as many people kicking and screaming with them to go and serve, it's because they've been stirred. Have you been stirred? I know some of you have. And some of you stir me. And that's the greatest gift that we can give each other. And it's how we demonstrate our faith before God and to others. That's how we are the shining light that God expects us to be. Thank you.
Thank you, John. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, you know, all these things that he's mentioning here, um, I was just graduated high school when I went to Panama and just now graduating BIM, the school I just went to for preaching, I got to go to a lot of congregations in that two years and preach and visit with people and and there's a lot of memories that I made but after 12 plus years no memory pops out like the memory that I had when I was in Panama as a as a just somebody that just graduated high school to see all of these things that he just brought up to see the faith of the people you know walking miles and miles and miles just to go to to congregation and you know, to compare that here with, you know, some things Bob touched on there, the, the fact that we're so blessed and they have nothing and that they would walk that far to, to go to services and some of us won't drive across town. And to see those things is, is something that lasts a, a lifetime. And it's been, you know, many years for me, but it's, it's always stuck in my mind those things and, and always helped me to appreciate my faith but also just how blessed that we are so i appreciate that uh, appreciate you guys we'll take a real short break and then we'll have brother carrie and uh this time we'll ask brother richard friedenall to come and uh, close us out in a prayer Bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We come before you glorifying you and, and wanting praising your name, Father, and in, in what we do. And and Father, we are we come together as a group of people who are aware of that we have a mission, that we have an opportunity and an obligation and a blessing that is to to find ways and and means that we can reach out to others and to bring them into our family. Father, we pray that as your people, we can be that light that we need to be. We thank you so much, Father, for those who are here today to that represent LAM and to represent the mission fields and, and the opportunities that exist for us, Father. And we pray that as a group that we, uh, we are people that take advantage of this and that, that we let ourselves be stirred. Father, thank you so much for what you have done for us, for the blessings we have in our lives because of you, all spiritual and all physical blessings, and especially for the blessing of your Son and the hope of eternal life we have through him and a relationship with you. Forgive us of our sins, Father, in Christ's name, amen.
that's my cue to probably get up here pretty quickly. <laughs> I saw Frank make a way, make his way up here. So, uh, last but not least, we have Brother Kerry Gillis with us, and uh, we again like to thank every one of these guys for for being here. And and Kerry, he has been the director there at Latin American Missions for the last two years, and before that, he was down in way south of Texas down in, at the at the border there he said and so he was there preaching uh, the gospel for about 13 years so we appreciate him and, and his work and and so we'd like to to welcome him as well and uh, we'll have Clayton again lead us in in a song and then we'll turn things over to brother Kerry Number 639, if you want to use the book, is Rescue the Perishing. Kind of the theme of your, your thing here. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, Thank you for having us. Um, don't go to sleep. First, I want to tell you, grab, grab a schedule for our campaigns. This has all our, our campaigns, the medical campaigns, the S2 campaigns that I'm going to talk about in a second, and uh, missions and evangelism camp, which is kind of a new thing. Also, we have a Yes2 campaign little brochure here. These are available at the table back there. So please get, get those, get your calendars and plan to go. I want to show you, this is the total numbers for, we had five campaigns this year. Uh, we had two medical campaigns, one in Peru, one in Honduras. We had three Yes2 campaigns, one in Peru, one in Panama, and one in Costa Rica. And total, total numbers, uh, doors knocked. You see, one of the things about, there are different strategies for evangelism. When you go door knocking, you knock on someone else's door. Uh, when you do a medical campaign, they knock on your door. And so the 2,409 is from the Yes2 campaigns. We knock on other people's doors. But as you see there, contacts, to that's total people that we came in contact with because of our efforts in all five campaigns, 5,739. And I want you to notice something that is, is quite fascinating is that, and this is, this, we're gonna, I'm going to keep watching this and tracking this. I was talking late last night with Kirk about this, that that if you look at that number of contacts and then you look at the baptisms, what we have found consistent is it's about 1%. About 1% of the people that we meet, they become what we call the 333, they're hot contacts, or we find people who are, uh, there's different ways that you could say it, it's people who are interested in studying more, uh, who are, who are excited enough or open enough that we can follow up with them and talk more with them. And usually that's, that's about, and see, that's just for my campaigns. And here, I'm going to show you, in a second, I'll show you that I had 33 baptisms, and those 333 are actually the hot contacts from just my three campaigns. So it's actually one, or it's actually 10% of the hot contacts were baptized. So it's usually from the contacts, there's about 10% who are willing to talk from that, and about 10% of those 
within that week get baptized. So from those you meet to those who get baptized is about 1%. We're going to keep tracking that. It's fascinating. Well, that shows you just, a, just kind of a basic principle of evangelism is that if you've been trying to convert your neighbor for 35 years, um, no wonder you're discouraged. Evangelism is about, is about casting a very broad net and, and getting as many people as you can introduced to a pathway to Christ, engaging their receptivity and then following up with them and having a plan for that. Most of the times, congregations don't have a plan to cultivate contacts. They don't have a plan to follow up with those contacts. And you have a low percentage of people in a congregation that are equipped to do a Bible study with somebody. And, but if you have those three simple things, you're talking about learning, you, have, you learn how to do just those really, really simple things, then you'll have a lot of contacts. Like I can tell you how you have more contacts right now than you could, than you could follow up with in a year. Right now. I'll give you the, here it is, okay? If everybody in this room, I don't know how many people are from this congregation, but if you take this, if some of you are from another congregation, take this back to your wherever, wherever you're from, and, and you'll be able to have more contacts than you can follow up with. You don't have to knock on one door, Okay. Just write down yourself, all the people that you know. You can just do 10 if you want to. But write down all the people that you know personally who are not Christians. Just write it down. And then, and then combine that list with, amongst the congregation. Now, a better way to do it is to think of all the people who are um, having some sort of difficulty in their life. They had a death in the family. They're sick. Uh, or we just had a hurricane. We had two hurricanes in, in a year ago through Valdosta, we have a lot of people who have, who have trees on their houses who are in a lot of need. And so if some, something's going wrong in somebody's life, just that you know, then you write that down. Your whole congregation can compile a list of those. Then your whole congregation writes cards to them and mails them to them so that everybody gets 50 cards maybe. And then soon after that, we can have two weeks, three weeks later, systematically. Whoever, whoever person matches them on that list, you go and visit them. And you just check in with them. You say, hey, I just want to see how you're doing. We've been praying for you. And they'll probably say, hey, uh, i got a bunch of cards sitting here. That's never happened before. And then all of a sudden what you have is somebody who is, is experienced something they've never experienced before. They're, they're open in a way that maybe they've never experienced. They've probably been shown love in a way they've never been shown love before. And you have done already what you have to do because no one owes you a Bible study. You earned a Bible study probably. And then all you have to do is ask them, is you say, would you like to know more about the church? And what are they going to say? Are they going to say, no, it's, I can tell us a bunch of terrible people over there. No, they're probably going to say, yeah, sure, I'd like to know more about that. And that's when you have scored a Bible study with them. Now, if everybody had did that, and every congregation that's represented here, how long would it take you to follow up with all those people? What I'm saying is this. It's, it's not for a lack of people who are lost and would be willing to listen to the truth. For the most part, it's a lack of just learning and training and having a plan that everybody follows. So what I will talk about as briefly as I can is what's called the Yes To campaigns, and then a little bit about how your congregation can get involved in this work. The Yes To campaign started, uh, and I'll say they get, they're summed up. The yes To campaigns are summed up by 2 Timothy 2.2. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 that Kirk uh, quoted earlier, mentioned earlier, is what I call the perpetual discipling passage. It's where you, you take the gospel and you entrust it to faithful men, and you teach them well enough that they're able to teach somebody else. And it's a continual cycle. You teach people who, you teach them to be able to teach others so that they'll be able to teach others and be able to teach others. That's why at a certain point in time, for Paul to be removed as, you might say, a player from the church in the, in the work of the church, for him to be removed was okay. Because he had, he had done that with so many. He had taught people how to teach people how to teach people that, that he had worked himself out of a job, so to speak, so that just because he had, he had been removed and had been called home, the work of the church kept going. And so um, the Yes To campaigns are a place where those who, I won't even necessarily say younger people, but those who, who aren't really that confident 
in doing evangelism can come on this campaign. And here's my goal. I do three of these campaigns. And this is my goal on a campaign. If you come on one of my campaigns, when you go home, you will know how to do evangelism, probably in a way that you'll be able to lead it at your congregation. Not because it's complicated, but because you'll be introduced to a plan that you're going to enact while you're there. And either that, or you'll be able to know how to lead VBS. And typically, those who are doing VBS, and like we go into the schools, we like to try to go into the schools, uh, a lot of times those who are doing VBS and those who are on evangelism teams, they'll switch out a little bit and they'll learn how to do both of them. At Forest Park, for years, I don't even know how it started. It's actually a, kind of a, a debate about that. There's, a, there's a, a youth enrichment seminar, or, or yes, weekend, that we have every February. And we have a lot of people that come to that from all over. And, and so this Yes Weekend, was really, it's really been a hit for a long time. And at one point in time, the idea was floated, why don't we, now that we're training young people or encouraging young people in, unto faithfulness, now let's, now let's take them into the field. And so we started what's called Yes 2, Yes 2 campaigns. That's the first campaign that I went on. 2016, I was invited, hey, do you want to go on a campaign? As was mentioned, I preached at a place for a really, really long time. It's my church family there on the Mexican border. I lived six miles from Mexico for 13 years at a bilingual congregation. And I got a phone call, and someone said, hey, would you like to come on one of our campaigns? You have bilingual people. You can bring translators. And so I started bringing groups. And I did that until COVID happened. And when COVID happened, a lot of different things happened um, that were you might say, led to the point where a reset button had to be hit with Latin American missions. And so I had been doing work with Latin American missions, and I knew some of the people at Forest Park a little bit, and I had, I had been enacting and carrying out, and I, I didn't even really start it. I was just kind of there doing it, uh, an evangelism plan where I preached. And so I got a phone call, and they said, would you like to help out with Latin American missions? I said, I'll help out in any way, and I can. And they said, how about full time? And I said, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how to do any of that, and I'm still, I'm still figuring out what I'm doing. But um, what I do know is this, is that the campaigns that I went on, I, I mean, let me tell you how narrow, narrow the scope is of what I knew. I went on these campaigns, I didn't even know about the school. I think I'd heard about it. I didn't know the connection. So in all my campaigns, I make sure I tell the story. What you're doing is part of a bigger picture that's connected to the school. And the reason that we're able to do these campaigns and have, have this network of preachers and translators and the way that the church is working together in Latin America is because for about six decades we've been training about 700 preachers who have gone out and now we have quite a network that we work with or are able to do these campaigns with. And so uh, doing a campaign is not just you're going to go and you're there and it's kind of an island to itself. No, it's, it's part of... It's part of keeping the momentum going of the big machine of the work. It's the way you can think of these campaigns. And I was, that's what I was doing. But what I noticed in my own personal ministry was that it was transforming the mindsets and the lives of the young people that I was bringing. Well, not even the young people, but everyone that I was bringing with me in my groups. They would come and they would go home. And then over time, they began to outgrow spiritually everyone else in the congregation. So when... So when, I, they, when they asked me, they said, would you, would you consider coming? I, I sat down with everyone in my congregation and talked with them and said, what do you think about this? And they said, we know how worthy the work is because we know how it's impacted us. And so they said, we don't want you to go, but we think it's providential for you to go and just do what you can to help this work continue, to help it grow, and to help get other congregations in because, and this is really the key to the campaigns, because it isn't just a matter of the rich Americans pouring money into another country. It's a matter of understanding that if you'll take the opportunities, you can leverage everything that we're doing to make it mutually beneficial to everyone who's involved. So that not only is our congregations in the United States helping, sending money in, manpower, encouraging, training those in Latin America, but that those who go and do those who send, those who send money, that there is a reciprocal and a mutual edification to that and a benefit to that. And so one of the things that we do with the Yes2 campaigns is, is leveraging the opportunities that we have instead of leaving things on the table. 
that, that we could have done. And that's kind of how I've approached it. How can I do this more efficiently? How can I take better opportunities? Uh, how can I not leave opportunities on the table that were there? Um, so, in the S2 campaigns, if I could just sum it up, we split up everybody into evangelism teams. And so, it depends on really how many men there are who can lead an evangelism team. That's going to determine how many teams we have. Every team has a, a team leader, a translator, a woman, if we have enough women, and their job is to keep really good records. And that's one of the keys to having a successful campaign and successful evangelism. If you don't keep really good records, you can't follow up. And people fall through the cracks. Uh, and then we usually have a, a local from the congregation, if we have enough of those who accompany the team. And then we have young people who go on the team, or even just people who are um, not confident in doing their own thing. They go and they watch. They, they see, okay, this is how you talk to someone. Okay, this is how you have a Bible study. And they learn how to do it. And what, what I've found, it's kind of hilarious. There will be preachers who will come on these campaigns, and I will say, do you want your own team? And they'll say, I, I don't, I'm really I'm not confident comfortable, but they'll say, I'm not confident that I can do it. You imagine a, a preacher who comes and he's not confident in having a Bible study with people. Well, it happens all the time with these campaigns. And I'll tell him, I say, it's no big deal. It'll be fine. I'm just going to put you on somebody else's team who has already knows the drill. They know what they're doing. And I'll tell them, I'll say, and pretty soon, probably tomorrow, you'll come back to me and you'll say, okay, I'm ready. Because look, it's not that complicated. It's about just learning a, a few little things because competence it doesn't take that much to get competent at something like this. Competent gives you, competence gives you confidence. So I had a preacher from the Valdosta area who's about my age, and he came on a campaign, and he's like, man, I don't know how I can do this. He'd never been out of the country before. And he was just kind of out of his sorts and uh, out of his element. And about six hours into the first day, he comes to me and he says, okay, I'm ready for my own team. Because all he needed was a little bit of time with another guy who knew what he was doing. And he was able to do it. And then he went, and they, his team was baptizing people. All right? And so the Yes 2 campaign is a matter of having evangelism teams that are a men mentorship setting. They're small little mentorships. Uh, and, and I think the youngest, let's say, our youngest team leader we had this year was, I think, 18 years old. And uh, the woman on his team was... 14, she was 14 years old. <laughs> and the translator was 19, all right? And uh, the first day they baptized somebody. And so you, you have someone who's twice his age goes on his team and learns how to do it, not because it's rocket science, but because of most of the times we just haven't exposed ourselves to that, to have a little bit of training. And to see, it's not, it's not gonna kill me if I knock on somebody's door, hey, I'm terrified to knock on a stranger's door, but I do it all the time, but I'm terrified of it. Because that's just, that's not something that's easy for me. But I know that I'm not going to die, and I know it's really not, it's, it's, the worst is not going to happen, and typically people are nice if I'm genuine and I show them that I love them. And when I do that, um, it turns out really well, typically, even the United States. And so I do it because I've done it enough to know I'm not going to die. Because most people think, I'm just going to die. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to implode, and people just get scared. And so they don't do it. So a lot of people don't do evangelism because the kind of the fear of the unknown. Half of fear is fear of the unknown. And when you're just exposed a little bit to something that when you get into it a little bit, you think, oh, wait, this really isn't that bad. Then you, then you have a confidence about doing that. And so that's, that's a lot of what these campaigns are about. So my initial visit to a campaign, I'm going to, uh, I'll be going to three, three countries. What I do on my first visit is I meet with the congregation, I stand before them, and I lay out the evangelism plan that, that we're going to do when we do the campaign. And I, I spell it out for them, and I give them materials, and I say, okay, now you have an evangelism plan. When we get here, I want you to already have contacts for us to follow up with. And so when, when the campaigners come and we, and we get there, I go through it again. When they're all there, I say, this is our evangelism plan and we're going to do it. It's not that complicated, but it's just a plan that we're all going to do. Now, when I do that, what I tell them is, okay, now you have a plan that you're going to do this week, and you're going to know how to do it because it's really simple to be able to take it home because most congregations do not have an evangelism plan. You can take this plan home, and you can start doing having an evangelism plan. Start cultivating contacts, learning how to follow up with those contacts, having Bible studies, and you got new converts. 
It's really not that complicated. It's just a matter of having a plan and, and, and everyone saying, yes, we're going to do this plan. You, you wouldn't believe how hard it is just for a congregation to say, to agree on a plan. And for everybody to say, okay, we're going to do it. There's way, we're way too comfortable and addicted to our comfort and complacent. And so we don't do it. And so this is, a, this is a place that energizes, but not only, you know, you think about someone who goes on a campaign, you hear about them, they come back and they're just like on fire and they're, oh, this is awesome. And I've been there, but, but then they, they look around and they think, okay, now what do I do? Well, one of the things that we try to do in these campaigns is, is give them really simple tools. When they get home, they know what to do. And so they have a way to channel that fire Okay, let's see here. Um, this is Arequipa, Peru. We had, this is our biggest one uh, this year. And uh, let's see here. This is, Travis Lewis is one of our elders here. He's having a Bible study with somebody. This is the Bible studies are sacred because this is the moment at which someone's life is changing because they're getting introduced to the truth. And so uh, this are translated by, I think his name is Abraham Alata there. Really great guy. And this is right in front of the church building. This is kind of an impromptu, and they studied for hours just sitting there. And he was just showing her, I, I, I care about you, I love you. And we're, we're going to see what Jesus has to say to you. And so um, it's all focused towards the understanding that the way that people become Christians is, is through Bible studies. And so uh, we use what's called a Bible study booklet called Does It Matter? We don't have to use that, but I have that as a way for someone who doesn't know how to do Bible study. If you can read, you can do this Bible study with somebody. And I, say, and I bring a bunch of them and say, here, you just sit down with someone and you just ask the questions and answer, and, and answer them by reading, this, reading passages. And I think, I don't know if they have one there. They, every, everybody's got them all spread out doing that. And they're simple enough. I even use those studies, a guided Bible study. I can write my own, I've written my own Bible studies, but I found that if you use one that's written by somebody else, then it, it removes you from the equation, it removes your ego, it, it gets you out of the way. It just puts somebody having to look at the Bible, and it's not about you and them, it's about them and God. And so that's what we try to do with, with understanding that the Bible studies are the key and how we should think of and treat those Bible studies. Of course, we also have VBS where we go into the schools. I mentioned that. <clears throat> of course, it culminates in having baptisms. We had, we had 55 this year. And, um, but then I tell, I tell them during the week, I say, look, we don't need to get hung up on the numbers, really. Because not everyone who is, has a soft heart, who is weighing the evidence and weighing the cost of becoming a disciple, a lot of people are not going to become a Christian right away. So I tell them, I say, here's the important number. The important number is how many contact cards do we have? And, and specifically, those are the people who have, who have shown that they are interested in a way that's beyond most people, and they're willing to give us their information so we can follow up with them. So here's, this is... Um, uh, this is actually last year. There was Raphael we're the, in the church in Ica, Peru. And um, this was the very last day, the very last night. I was giving them a stack of contact cards. The contact cards, they either represent one person or a family. And uh, I was entrusting to them and showing them these represent souls. And that, and that you cannot let these people fall through the cracks. And charging them that you need to follow up with these. And that, that uh, if, if we understand that a lot of the complaints about short-term missions is, is that you go somewhere and then you leave and then what you did just kind of falls flat, right? Instead of understanding that, no, a short-term mission is a matter of having a temporary injection of manpower and, and money, really. And then understanding that if you can keep really good records, and that the congregation has a plan to follow up, then the momentum will continue after you leave. And so it's a matter of having, having something in place. Uh, these are the numbers just from the Yes2 campaigns. As you see there, we had almost 3,000 contacts, and about 10% were hot contacts, and about 10% were baptized. That's a fascinating statistic to me. And so what we do is, is we have, um, on these campaigns, 
I try to keep it very education heavy. It's a lot of practical instruction, but really it's in the field. And in the evenings when we, when we have a, a lesson in the evenings with just the English speakers, then what we do after that lesson is we discuss the lesson, and then we have a time of what I call troubleshooting. What did you run into today? What challenges did you face today? What kind of Bible questions did you run into? Or doctrinal things that you're having difficulty uh, discussing? And we will address those things. And we have very nuts and bolts training of, this is how you address this type of doctrinal matter. This is how you address this type of situation in a family. And, and so I found that to be a very, a very beneficial thing that as they walk away from it every day, Every day they're more and more equipped. And as John said, what you find is, is that every, when everybody has a place on a team and everybody, either as an evangelism team or in a VBS team, everybody has a job, everybody knows what their job is, and everybody's doing that job and they're happy to do it. And specifically when they know, and this, this can be in any congregation, they know that, that their job is specifically tied to evangelism. I would tell you this, if what you're doing in the church does not have a connection to evangelism, put that on the shelf until you can figure out how to tie that to evangelism. Because when you're able to figure out, okay, this is the, the talent that I have for the church, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect it in a way to evangelism. I'm going to leverage this towards evangelism. Then bring that back out and go with it. And on these campaigns, what you see is, you see the church functioning at 100%, which raises your expectation back here at home. What can the church do if we all know what we're supposed to do? See, our, you know, my job in the church is not to sit at a pew or to show up or to be a good Christian. My, my job is going to be something very specific in the congregation as part of an overall plan towards moving evangelism forward. So what's your job? Do you know what your job is? If you don't know what your job is, you have one and you just need to figure it out. And it may be, and take a little bit of time and a little bit of effort. And over time, your job within the church, as you grow, naturally is going to evolve into something else, and that's fine. Right now, it may be just enough, as one lady named Valerie who told me, I think I mentioned this at Polish in the Pulpit, it was my first campaign. At the end of the week, she said, she said, I was on an evangelism team, and my job was to watch kids and entertain them so that the parents could have Bible study. And she said, it's the first time I felt valuable to the church. And it's, a, it's an absolutely valuable thing to the church, just to be able to watch kids. It's directly connected to evangelism. And what, what you find with these campaigns is, is, is this, is you discover a value to the kingdom that you didn't realize you had before. It may, not seem, it may seem insignificant, but when you understand this is the part I'm playing in the big picture of a plan that's going in this direction and everybody's on board, and, and if I don't do my part, the plan falls apart, that's when someone begins to see their value to the church. And so you begin to raise your expectation for what the church can be, and you raise your expectation for what you can be and for what you can do. Um, whether it's someone who's never translated before, um, whether it's someone who's never done a Bible study before, by the, by the end of the week, they'll know how to do a Bible study. And they'll, because what, simple as this, it's not that hard. But it's a matter of them being put in a situation where they can discover that, or where they can be, have, uh, be empowered in that way. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite pictures here on the right. This was last year in Penitome, Panama. Uh, we had a couple of buses, and we had to go to lunch. But I was in another bus 30 minutes away because before lunch, we went to three schools to do VBS. And we, and we pulled it off, but it was time for lunch, and we didn't have, and we needed both buses to take everybody. And so I just called them. I called, this is Miranda right here. I don't know if this is going to... She, the one with the big fat smile on her face and the sunglasses taking the selfie. She, Miranda is the one who invited me on my first mission trip. And I called her and I said, put everybody on the bus and just take them to lunch. She said, we, 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 have, we have 35 people. It's a 26 passenger bus. I said, have fun. And she says to me, this picture. And here's the great thing about this picture. is when There's one, I think, one guy maybe two, who are not smiling. 
Everybody, and it, you can zoom into this picture, and you can keep, it just, people just keep appearing in this not very large bus, but everybody is happy, and they're miserable, all right? They're miserable. And this is one of the amazingly beautiful things about these campaigns is that it is a place, and you can train yourself to do this, it is a place where you can train yourself how to be uncomfortable for souls. You know, we're comfortable, but if we push ourselves, if we allow ourselves to be in an environment where our comfort zone is just pushed to a place that makes us want to jump out of our skin, right? There are a lot, of, a lot of people that they come in the first couple of days, like they're deer in headlights, and they're like, I don't know what I'm, they're like panicky, right? So the job, what's the job of the campaign director, right? The, our job is to just be chill, all right? Everything's fine, don't worry about it. Everything's okay. There, everybody's panicking, you're like, no, everything's fine. Or we, we're missing our flight, we don't care to get, everything's going to be fine. And you just have to show them it's going to be okay. Yeah, my luggage is, it's going to be okay. We'll go get you some clothes, all right? I have some spare underwear you can have. It's going to be all right, right? And so what you do is, is you're able to show them what we're doing here is worth it no matter how uncomfortable this is. And it's going to be hard. There are going to be times where you're going to be asked to squeeze onto a bus and there's not enough room. And, uh, and in that process, you're able to train yourself how to be uncomfortable for the sake of souls. What happens when you train yourself in that way and you, are, you do that several years in a row. What's that going to be like when you come to your home congregation? What's that going to do to you when you're trying to initiate evangelism or talk to your neighbors or talk to the cashier at the restaurant or whatever, right? What's that going to do for you? It's gonna, what you're going to find is, is because you've been training yourself to be uncomfortable, is you're going to do things you never thought you'd be able to do before. And you won't even know until you've kind of crossed that threshold and you kind of look back at yourself and you say, well, I've never done that before. That's kind of funny. I usually would have cried and went in you know, fetal position in the corner if I was going to do that before. But I've been on these campaigns, and somehow or another, I've just, my brain's been tweaked. And it's a real thing. It's a real training. Now, also, I started this year a missions and evangelism camp. I just want to mention, mention that briefly, what that is. I got invited from the managing director of a camp that I grew up going to. He's about my age. He and his father uh, run this camp. They asked me and uh, the, another preacher to come and do a camp where we are specifically doing a couple things. We're training how to do evangelism, just nuts and bolts. This is how you do evangelism. And we're introducing young people to opportunities and missions. That's what we're doing. And so we have a time where we're just doing nuts and bolts training. And this is what we do every day is we do practice Bible studies. You just do um, practice Bible studies with people. You sit down, you do a Bible study, and you just, you just see how easy it is, and you learn how to do it in kind of a non-threatening way, and you take turns doing it with each other. And by the end of the week, what do you know how to do? You know how to do a Bible study, right? Then one of the things we do is, is, is we have a, every day we have a time where it's our troubleshooting. What did you run into in your study today that maybe would be difficult to explain if someone asked you some more questions about it? What are some things that, you've, that you perhaps will face when you're evangelizing in your community or within your family or something? And then we have a time where we go through and we give them solutions for those things and how to address things from Scripture, how to, how to reason through some doctrinal issues that perhaps are going to be difficult that they're definitely going to run into. And, and in this week, we, as we do in the campaigns, we focus on really the spiritual focus and status and priorities of somebody's life so that they are really asking themselves the question, are they really faithful? Are their priorities really in order? What are their real goals? Um, let's see, here's the schedule for, well, these are the ones that I'm leading, and I just, just pick up a, a schedule in the back. Um, but this leads us into congregational involvement. Let's see, what time is it? Congregational involvement, which is directly connected to the campaigns because part of Congregational involvement is the campaigns, but that's not, that's not everything. You can think of the campaigns as sort of a doorway into the work. Uh, it's one of, one of the ways that we introduce people into the work. And so the campaigns are really a training ground for your particular congregation to start doing their own campaigns. Our campaigns, we don't do them in the same place every year. We go different places because our campaigns, they serve as a model 
for how to do campaigns. So when someone goes on campaigns with us, it's not so that they can go on campaigns with us forever, even though we love doing campaigns with the same old people all the time. But ultimately what we'd like for is for people who go on our campaigns to look at what they're doing in this campaign and say, okay, we're going to take this model and when we go to our congregation, we're going to pick a congregation somewhere. We're going to pick a preacher and a place and we're going to focus in on that place and we're going to start doing campaigns there. And what that does is that removes Latin America missions as, as you might say, the, uh, the, the gatekeeper of missions. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is, is help to facilitate all congregations to take a real ownership of missions. And so these campaigns offer a chance for you to get your feet wet, to get introduced to a country and a culture, to connect you with people who are there, with preachers, uh, with translators, uh, to cultivate uh, relationships with people there and with people in the United States. And I, this is something that I've personally been doing is acting with several congregations as a consultant for helping them figure out how to do their own campaigns. And they still like to do campaigns with us, but they want to do their own. And we want them to do their own. And I want you to think of it in this way. Like this, this next year, we're going to do five campaigns. Latin American Missions is. What if we doubled that? What if we did 10, right? Man, that'd be great. But what if, instead, we empowered and trained and coached and consulted with dozens of other congregations who began to do their own? And over the course of several years, we were able to facilitate, say, a hundred more campaigns because it isn't just a matter of how many campaigns can we do. It's a matter of how many congregations can we get enlisted into the idea that they can do it themselves. You know, when, when COVID happened, it was Miranda. I mean, she called me up and she said, hey, let's do our own campaign. And you know what I told her? I didn't tell her this, but this is what I thought. I said, do we have permission to do that? And I thought, God, that's kind of ridiculous. And that's one of the things I found myself. When I go around to congregations, I tell them, I say, I am going to give you right today permission to do your own campaign. I, I, not that you need it or that I can give it, but that's, we, we need to understand in our minds, you know what? Um, it isn't just for those who've been doing it for a long time. It isn't just for those who we think have a pattern and have it figured out and have all the connections. And perhaps it's just a matter of going us on some campaigns, going on some campaigns with us, seeing how it's done, learning, learning about a few different options of places you can go and visit. And then over time, we can kind of coach you and connect you to people, and you can start doing your own. And what's that going to do to your congregation? What's that going to do to congregations in Latin America when we begin to really divide? That's one of the ways your congregation can get involved. Now, this is the end of our campaign in Panama this year when we went and visited the school. And so this is all the campaigners and all of the students and their families at the school because one of the ways that you can participate in missions is to have a, a, a sharp focus on the school. The Bible School of the Americas is the hub of our work. The network within which we do our campaigns is only made possible because over the past 59 years, we've trained about 700 preachers. Without that, we don't even really have the campaigns to do. The campaigns were started as a means, by, as a, a means of helping to encourage and further the works of those alumni from the school. And so I would encourage you, as some of you here have done, visit the school, encourage the students, spend some time there. There are things that can be done to help them get ready for new students to come in. Uh, you can do, possibly some of you have done, I think Rick done seminars. Uh, I think you've done ladies' classes too, visiting uh, area congregations and that kind of thing. And, and showing them encouragement, instruction. Let me tell you, let me tell you when, you, when you visit a culture in which a church culture devoid of elderships, where they do not understand a culture that has elders, then when you begin to talk to them about what it's like to have elders, and you begin to show them this is what's normal within an eldership, this is, this is what it means to submit to an eldership, this is really the role of elders, this is not what the role of elders are, and things like that, they're sitting on the edge of their seat because they don't know. We kind of take it for granted, but when we, be, when we go and we mentor and we coach them and we kind of come alongside them 
And that's what happens when you take a congregation under your wing and you say, okay, what do you need? Well, they need first your worldview, your church, church culture worldview. It's normal to have elders and they're not used to that. And that's a huge thing just to show them what it's like for that to become a normal thing that, and teach them in that way. You elevate them in that way. And so there are lots of different ways that you can support the school. Uh, Kirk talked about kind of the financial needs of the school. Uh, it's about $1,500 per student per month. It's, it's kind of a rough number that we put out there. Gives you an idea of, of how much it costs because they live there, they get a stipend there every month, and, uh, and that covers the overhead. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. And so um, perhaps you can pick one of our guys who's about to graduate, and, and you can make plans to follow him into his new work, encourage him, mentor, train, perhaps commit to, um, to supporting him. And that those are some of the ways that you can do it. It's, it's really just your imagination, your creativity are the limit of how you can bless the school and how you can get involved. Uh, one of the things we are encouraging congregations to do is things like this. And even within their congregation is to have a time where they focus on the work. They talk about the work that they're connected to, showing the congregation where they are. These are the things that we're doing. This is the part of the bigger work that we're a part of and having special contributions. That's one of the things we do with Lamb Sunday. And so, there's a lot more I could say. I just want to finish with, with just a thought here. Just, to, just a, a thought for you to carry with you. In Acts chapter 8, the second half of the chapter, there's two characters, unless there's a guy driving the chariot. But you have Philip and you have the Ethiopian. And you have represented there, you have the two, the two categories in the world. You have those who are evangelizing and those who are in need of being evangelized. And that means there's two categories of people in the church. There are those who are evangelizing and there are those who are in need of being evangelized. Which means if you're not one who's being evangelized, who's, if you're not one who's doing the evangelizing, then that means that you're actually in need of being evangelized. The word evangelize or evangelism is from a Greek word, a euangelion, which just means the gospel. Evangelize literally means to gospelize, or the idea that you, you are taking the gospel, the good news about Christ, that he died for you, that you're guilty of sin, and you'll die without him, and he has died for you and been resurrected from the dead so that you can be saved from your sins. It's the good news. And you're, you, to gospelize or to evangelize is to take that reality and to intersect that into somebody's life. In Luke 22, verse 61... You have, you have Jesus is at the house of the high priest, and Peter has just denied him for the last time. And it says just in Luke, it says that Jesus, Jesus' eyes, as Peter turned, Jesus' eyes met the eyes of Peter, and he looked at him. And that's when he went out and wept bitterly, remembering that Jesus had said, you were going to deny me. To evangelize is to make someone look at the truth. Isaiah 53, verse 3, He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Most of the world is hiding their faces from God. They do not want to look into the eyes of Christ and grapple with the truth. To evangelize is to take someone's head, sort of, and point it towards Christ and say, I want you to look at what the reality is of who Christ is, what he's done for you, and what your life is, is without him and with him. That's what evangelism is. Which means that there are a lot of Christians... There are a lot of Christians. They're not evangelizing. And they need to look into the eyes of Christ. And they need to be convicted by that. Uh, they need to understand that they've been given what they don't deserve. And that it's their duty to show others what Jesus has given that they don't deserve. You know, what we're doing in Latin America Missions is we have the honor of allowing God to use us as instruments of this purpose of helping people look into the eyes of Christ and to be changed forever. And we're thankful that you have been such an encouragement to us and that you're fellow soldiers with us in this fight. It is, a, it is an honor and such a worthy work to help people look at Christ and change their lives.
Thank you for having us. Please take, get our cards. Keep in touch with us. If you have any questions about how you can get involved in this, um, there are so many different ways. Everyone brings something different to the table. And, um, and so there's a way for you to connect your talents to the greater work of evangelism in some way. So thank you so much for having us here. Thanks again. You mentioned there early on, but mentioned there that he's still trying to figure out what he's doing. At least he's not Frank and been doing it for many years and still doesn't seem to know what he's doing. I'm just kidding. I had to beat up on Frank one more time. Seemed like the pattern. It was good to be, it was good for you guys to be here, all of you guys. We really appreciate that. I want to uh, give a couple more thank yous real quick. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to these guys, but uh, thank you also to Terry and Ruth, who are not in here, but worked on, yeah, getting all that food prepared, and I'm sure there was other people involved, so uh, thanks to them, and then thanks to Rick and Paul, because this took a lot of a lot of work to and, and months to, to kind of plan and everything, so appreciate the elders and, and everybody that was involved to make it happen, and so we, uh, again, want to continue to pray for them and try to get involved if we can, and and uh, just hopefully, you know, Lord willing, as, as Bob mentioned there, that wherever we go, at the very least, we're in a mission field, and, and our job is to, to spread the, his word. So um, at this time, uh, we'll ask Brother Paul Fisher to dismiss us. Will you bow with me, please? Our most kind, holy, heavenly Father, we want to thank you tonight for allowing us to have our eyes opened and our hearts opened to some of the works that are going on around us, for some of the works that we need to be involved in, Father, that we can be pleasing in your sight. Holy Father, please be with these men who have come and are introducing us to these things. Help us, Father, to keep our eyes open and to look at the techniques and the different mission trips to go wherever we can, especially to go to our neighbors and to realize that that's where our mission field begins is right outside the door. Dear Father, we pray that you would bless our efforts, bless the efforts of these gentlemen, give them safety, give them safety as they travel to and from, and be with their families and bless them. And Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us this day. Father, we're thankful for the food that we had to eat, for the comfortable building that we're in. Father, there's just so much that we are so blessed in this country with, and we thank you, Father. And we ask you to be with those of our congregation who are unable to come because of health problems, we ask if it is your will to heal them. And Father, we pray that we will be back tomorrow to worship you and to be encouraged and to encourage one another. And all these things, Father, we pray through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>